Welcome everyone to the course Pemikiran Social Tentang Kajian Ethnik Social Theories in Ethnic Studies RERE 6022 We'll go through the learning outcomes briefly At the end of this course, you'll be able to number 1. Integrate knowledge and practice in managing complex issues beyond the classroom Number 2. Evaluate and make decisions in situations with limited information with regards to social responsibility and research ethics. Number three, communicate the summary, knowledge, and rationale to experts and non-experts clearly. And finally, last but not least, you'll be able to use creative and critical thinking skills to progress knowledge. So what is the synopsis of this course? Let's go through briefly on what this course is all about. This course explores theories and concepts for analysing the nature of ethnic formation, ethnic identities, and the creative production of ethno-racial communities in Malaysia and other countries. Attention will be focused on the social organisation of differences in society, especially regarding the ways human beings create social categories and the significance of these categories in the daily life of the people. This course begins with an international overview of sociological perspectives to provide a foundation for theoretical analysis. It is then followed by a focus on Malaysian social thought perspectives, particularly on ethnic studies. The discussion will give particular attention to ethnicity or ethnic grouping as one of the principal social categories constructed to outline differences among human beings, apart from class, religion, gender, education, political affiliation, place of residence, and more. The discussion will also focus on the interactions between ethnicity and the social categories mentioned above, as well as the impact of these interactions on human life, particularly in a diverse society like Malaysia. The recent phenomenon of intersectionality will also be discussed. The contribution of ethnic studies in theory construction will also be highlighted and substantiated with empirical examples. This course covers 14 weeks and consists of 13 lectures and it will be based on a syllabus that's drawn from sociological theory. So basically, this course is all about sociology as the main theoretical and conceptual framework for you to understand ethnic studies in general. So in this entire course, I'll be covering uh, the various paradigms or perspectives within sociology. We'll start, of course, by defining what sociology is, and we'll go through a discussion of its ontology, epistemology, and methodology. So just as with any other subject or course, we have uh, basic key terms, terms that you'll be seeing a lot. They'll be cropping up a lot throughout this entire course. Now these terms are in English language, but yet they carry a slightly significantly different meaning from its regular use in the English language. So over here, I'll be explaining the particularly sociological usage of about 10 different terms. You will find these terms mentioned a lot when referring to certain phenomena. In general, this is called jargon, whenever you have very technical terms in any given subject. So over here, we're going to cover 10 different kinds of, or rather 10 examples of sociological jargon. The first being that of sociology itself. What differentiates the term sociology from other branches of social sciences? Of course, we have psychology, we have anthropology, and we have so many other types of social sciences, economics. But what makes sociology special is that it is the scientific study of human life, social groups, whole societies, and also the human mind. Now, when we say scientific here, we do not mean that human life is studied in a lab. We just mean that it follows certain principles of the sciences, which are also common to the social sciences. This means that we follow a certain systematic way of observing things. We have theories, we test them out. 
we, we form hypotheses and then we test them out. And then when they are proven to some extent, they become theories. And then we also test to see if these theories are disproved by making more and more observations. Rather than just hearsay or just drawing conclusions from limited observations, we are following a systematic observation. Therefore, it is called scientific. Next on the list is the definition of what the term society means. Society here can be seen as something intangible. Commonly, it means a national unit because we tend to take the entire nation state or a country, so to speak, as the basic unit of sociological analysis. But to look at it in a more intangible sense, we can also imagine society as a grouping of many, many individuals. Therefore, one other way of defining it is as a complex of institutions. It's about how any individual is embedded within a complex web of relationships, going all the way from the family to the immediate community, for example, the neighborhood, and then perhaps to the wider region or the state, to any social groups they belong to, and then the nation state. And further on, we can look at the entire relations between nation states, or what will come to in globalization, or the international system of states. So this brings us to the next term, which is called social institutions. We have just talked about imagining society as a complex of institutions. So what do these institutions imply? Institutions here, or rather social institutions, are established practices that regulate various activities that make up social life. So we tend to imagine that an institution might mean an organization or a building or something formal, or like an institute. But in the sociological sense, social institutions here are just referring to any intangible set of practices, which could be the way humans have done things um, from time immemorial throughout history. It could range from anything like barter trade to the way we use money or currency today. It could range from marriage um, to inheritance uh, to family relationships to customs, festivals, traditions and everything all the way into what defines ethnicity. So they are in fact practices that have long been established by human beings by trial and error throughout human history and they've been found to work and therefore we still retain these practices and it helps to regulate. It's like a set of rules and regulations that's not formal but that we still adhere to and these help us to set what the norms are in society to regulate various activities that make up social life. Thus, when talking about social institutions and the complex web of relationships. To be able to imagine this, we have to develop what is called a sociological imagination. This is a term that's coined by C. Wright Mills, a famous American sociologist. And what he meant here was being able to imagine how you yourself as an individual is really embedded within this complex web of relationships. In other words, no one is an island. So you have to be able to imagine how every single one of your actions would have social consequences on the people around you, as well as reflexively upon yourself. In other words, to have a sociological imagination is to be able to develop a broader view of social interaction and to have the ability to mentally locate or imagine ourselves objectively within the wider world in terms of the consequences of our actions. It is like you're imagining that you are a star in a movie now, and you're seeing this objectively, as though you're detached from, your mind is detached from your body, and you're seeing whatever you do or say has an impact on society, or this intangible web of relationships around you. This in turn brings us to the Latin origins of the word sociology. It comes from the Latin socius, which means companion, and logos, which means the study of. Hence, when put together, socius and logos, you get sociology, 
which is the study of companionship. Because after all, it is the study of social relations. And the focus of sociology is on social relationships. So this tells us that sociology is about studying not only the individual and not only the human mind, which is what psychology does, and uh, not how humans relate to material resources, which is what economics does, but how humans relate to social relations or social relationships, which is the focus of sociology. In other words, the basic unit of analysis for sociology is social relations. So when defining the units of analysis, we have to now differentiate between two terms, which can be rather confusing because they sound almost alike. The first is sociological problem, and the second is social problem. So when we talk about problems here, we do not refer to them necessarily as though it's a bad thing. We can see it as though it's a mathematical problem. Hence, the first problem here, which is sociological problem, is basically defined as anything that is a topic of interest to sociologists, any phenomenon regarding certain aspects of human behavior, or rather what we can call any research topic. So any topic that you decide to explore in your thesis would be defined as a sociological problem. So now we come to the other twin problem here, which um, might be used to refer to something that is a problem to society in the sense that we can talk about it neutrally, but it could threaten the social order. This is called social problem, and it refers to a phenomenon or aspect of human behavior that is harmful or pathological for social order. So now this brings us into the definition of what is social order. From the functionalist perspective, all sociologists want to know what is the glue that binds society together to ensure its stability, to ensure that all parts work together in harmony. So the social order refers to the stable patterns of interaction that have become routine in a society. In other words, this also brings us back to the previous term of social institutions and how these institutions work together smoothly without any conflict in between. This is, of course, as mentioned, a structural functionalist point of view because it implies or assumes that society always works in harmony and that there's no conflict. But we take this point of view here as a um, simplification of analysis so that we can start off from somewhere in a way that makes sense. So the social order is the stable patterns of interaction that have become routine in a society. And this is of great interest to sociologists because they wish to find out the exact mechanisms that help maintain social order in any given society. Hence, it's also known as the puzzle of social order because it puzzles sociologists, it puzzles everyone, even the layperson. How do all nation states work as a single unit given that it's made up of such diverse individuals? So puzzle here can also mean problem like when we do those puzzles, jigsaw puzzles. Hence, we have the term sociological problem. And a subset of sociological problem is social problem. That is when that problem becomes a threat to maintaining social order. In other words, pathological, like a disease. Then we come into the process of socialization, which is basically the process in which all individuals learn their place in society and learn about the norms and values that are acceptable and also those that are deviant or not acceptable. So socialization is the process in which all the diverse individuals learn to embrace the glue that binds them together to maintain this social order. In other words, it's defined as the process of acquiring and learning norms and values necessary to blend in as a member of society. When we have learned socialization, when we have acquired these norms and values, and we know our place in society, we are then described as having developed a social identity, 
which is a label that places people in particular social categories, which is acquired through socialization. For example, social identity refers to our gender, our position as a family member, our ethnicity, our religion, which state that we belong to, and which nation state that we belong to, and things like that. So let us now look at a kind of diagram that links all these previous sociological jargon or terms together in a way that is connected. In the middle of this diagram, we have the term sociology, defined as the study of society. And then it points downwards, the arrow points downwards. And uh, you have sociologists, they are the people who study society and attempt to develop a sociological imagination, which is a starting point for them to analyze the basic unit of analysis. And this sociological imagination links two very important concepts together, which are personal troubles and public issues. And this demonstrates that sometimes our personal troubles are really related to larger public issues. For example, a person who has lost their livelihood, their job, because of COVID-19, and they find that they are not able to earn any income in any other way, might feel alone, might feel isolated. But this is really part of a bigger picture in which there is a big pandemic, terrible disease, it affects so many industries like tourism, shopping, and so on and so forth, and it has resulted in a large-scale unemployment, which then affects people's income levels and trusts more people or more individuals into poverty, which then affects family relationships because families that have previously been stable are now torn apart when both the parents are unable to work or to earn income for the children. And then schooling is also affected because of uh, the inability to go to school as normal. So you have digital learning, which then leads to digital divide because not all families have enough devices or gadgets for all their children to participate uh, effectively. So that's a brief insight into how personal troubles can also be public issues, and public issues can also affect your personal troubles. So to go back upwards, sociology here is the systematic and scientific study of society, not scientific in the sense of being in a laboratory, but scientific in the sense of being systematic and objective. It studies human life within social groups and therefore entire societies. In classical sociology, the unit of analysis tended to be the whole nation state. But then, as we'll see later on in this course, the perspective switches to a more individualistic perspective. And so essentially, sociology is the study of the human world in groups. So now we come to the part where we discuss ontology.